Greetings, I'm Solar Scully, and welcome back to the Silent Hill commentary where... Well, we appear to be entering what looks to be some sort of... Uh, makeshift bomb shelter, assuming that this is not simply one of Silent Hill's twisted machinations, and uh... Given the bottles lying around that seem to be of some sort of a uh, narcotic substance, well... Yeah... Very morbid times ahead, but we seem to be entering the clock tower from one angle, and entering out the other. Very curious. Where am I? Have I been here before? Hmm. I don't remember this being here before. How strange. Yes, it seems we are in a familiar location, but the locations. Everything seems the same, but the music's a little bit more frightening. Ah, oh, well, nothing to worry about, I'm sure, until we enter this part of the building and... Oh, it seems the budget has uh, <laughs> suffered a rather rapid decrease. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is what Silent Hill fans would come to know as the other world. A decrepit, blood-rusted, hellish place where decay and entropy seem to be on the rise, and, well, abstract visions are aplenty, like that hanging body behind a fan. By the way, don't worry, you won't get sucked into that fan if you get too close, thankfully because of that bar over there. Yeah, so uh, if there's any way that I can describe Silent Hill's other world, well, I think I'm gonna have to rely on a uh, classic solo to Scully to fill us in, so classic solo to Scully, what do you got for us? Kids everywhere, man. We gotta shoot them down. Well, thank you for that, but anyway, to kind of discuss what, you know, the other world basically is upon basic visual terms, uh, pay close attention to the art design, because what you'll start finding is that it's basically reflecting a child's nightmare come to life. Again, you can see those hanging teddy bears up on the wall, uh, not to mention all the hanging bodies, uh, a lot of the hospital paraphernalia that we've been seeing previously. But yeah, a lot of the things that we would have otherwise seen in the normal school have been transformed in a very abstractified kind of fashion. Is abstractified a word? I don't know, but that's simply the power of the other world. Infecting my speech as it does my perception of reality. But uh, regardless though, the same rules still apply. I mean, you might notice that uh, apart from the areas we've already explored, all the, <laughs> all the previous areas marked on Harry's map are now very different. You've still got mumblers floating about the hallways, you still have lava stalkers to deal with, so... Yeah, it's pretty much, you know, our dungeon, except given a very distended, otherworldly twist. And that does also carry on into, apart from the imagery, how you progress as well, and uh, I think I might have gone into this a little bit in the previous part, but uh, for the sake of at least elucidating on it, well, <laughs> now, first of all, we have some new enemies, the... Do these enemies have a name? Uh, they're pretty much the bug enemies that also make an appearance in Silent Hill 2 and nowhere else. Curious. But anyway, to talk about the design, uh, in terms of how you progress throughout the other world, it's very similar in nature to how it was with the school, except the puzzle variances are a little bit different. You no longer have your objective of unlocking the clock tower to get us to the other world, so instead we're pretty much just, you know, moving our way around until we, well, as uh, the earlier puzzle had implied, finding our way down to the lowest beast and, uh, you know, stoking the flames to awaken the choking heat and uh, what beast we'll be finding well, is a monster that lurks. So, yeah. We'll get into that as we go on, but basically I'm just gonna praise the level design for pretty much filling us in on elements that we'll be seeing again. Like, for example, this little key card. That might look a bit familiar if you remember the, pi the picture in the teacher's lounge. In all very disturbing detail. But anyway, the salient point that I wanted to make was that, again, I'm just praising this game's level design with how much... I mean, basically with... You know, how much you're able to do in a given area, and how efficiently you can pretty much knock everything out in one fell swoop, without excessive backtracking or, you know, the level padding itself out with, oh no, we have a puzzle piece, but now it's in two. Oh no. So again, that's really... I don't know, it's just a facet of the game design that I happen to really enjoy, and uh... Yeah, areas are blocked off, you need to find a way around the place, and, you know, gradually by collecting items, unlocking doors, solving puzzles, you will eventually make your way towards the end boss, in keeping 
you know, with the whole sort of classic video game dungeon design that has been made famous from games as far back as the NES era. You know, I mean, you even have to look at games like fucking Fantasy Star, Final Fantasy, Legend of Zelda, that kind of thing. And what is this? The picture. It has become real. And more symbolism of hanging bodies are disguised with, you know, nothing else. Uh, but regardless though, you might recall, well I mean you probably couldn't have been able to hear over my waffling commentary, but you might have noticed the air raid siren uh, that was kind of ringing its ears before. Yeah, that's pretty much a transition to how you know that you're he heading into the hellish areas of Silent Hill. Something you could also tell, uh, actually right during the first nightmare sequence of the game when Harry chases Shaw down that alleyway. Yeah, very iconic thing about the Silent Hill series, and, uh, I mean, <laughs> kind of fitting since we're still in, uh, the primary school areas, actually, that, uh, yeah, my primary school actually had, uh, like an air raid siren very similar to that. I mean, the school was, like, uh, fairly old at the time, and I think probably would have had that siren installed for, you know, air raid practices. Uh, but, yeah, that was pretty much used to tell the students to get back to class, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, t uh, I mean, around, like, uh, fuck, what was it, 2009? Yeah, I was still technically on the cusp of primary school at the time, so that left a little surprise in my undies whenever it was like, eh, time to go home, except, oh no, it's, a uh, Silent Hill time again. And nobody knew what I was referencing, because Silent Hill was an old game, whereas I am new and fresh. And, of course, you might notice that, uh, hell is written on the walls. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. But all the same, though, uh, yeah, the, the other world is kind of responsible for some very topsy-turvy, uh, designs, so again, it isn't just a palette swap, you know, where you're pretty much going through the same areas, it does have a few twists which owe, uh, I'd say several dirts towards, again, the very Lewis Carroll sort of design of, uh, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland, that sort of thing, you know, where things sort of make a bit of sense, but not quite, and, uh, you really sort of need to follow the world by its own logic and, well, pay attention to its non-Euclidean geometry because, yeah, as I told you before, it's not just the art design that feels like an abstraction of, you know, a child's nightmare. It's also very much to do with, well, a child's logic of how things work. And that does play a very significant part into the fact that, you know, the fact that we're chasing Cheryl and uh, she seems to be leading Harry towards a lot of these very bizarre places. Could Cheryl be the one dreaming of all this? Oh god, no. And you know what, I, I was gonna say that I'd wedge her a bet if there was a Silent Hill 1 remake they'd try and do the whole thing where like, oh no, it's, it's not uh, the, the you know, spooky thing as you think. Instead, Harry was abusing her and that was her way of dealing with the problems, but, you know, then we had Shadow Memories, which was a little bit different. Yes. Well, that's quite spooky, and uh, notice that little uh, blood bag drip feed up there. Quite surreal. Anyway, we also have a little message over here. Are we going to read it? I suppose not. Yes, there is a little message written on the side of that door that says, uh, Leonard Ryan the Monster Lurks, and uh, if you're thinking it's meant to be a literary reference, uh, well, it might be, but no, actually, it's meant to be referring to, well, a certain other passage a little bit later. But anyway, as I was saying with a potential Silent Hill 1 remake, yeah, they'd probably reframe it as, you know, oh, uh, you know, supernatural, spooky stuff is not scary, so uh, instead it's all psychological, Harry was an abuser, uh, fuck it, do whatever else, even though Shadow Memories kind of implied that Dahlia was the, abu the abuser, you know, because she was an abuser, blah blah blah. Anyway, teleporting bathroom, which I explained in very padding detail in the first commentary, and the very part that you actually saw me reference, actually, so, yeah, teleporting bathroom, you notice by the very lengthy load time, don't worry, it's just Silent Hill fucking with you. It's a way of pretty much getting upstairs to, you know, collect a few items. You know, score some pennies and, uh... Oh, those poor bathrooms. Are you supposed to get any privacy around here? Oh uh, well, I guess not as if the monsters really care, because the mumbers are both alarmingly naked and probably don't even know the concept of the modern plumbing system. But in any case, though, enter this bathroom again, you pretty much, you know, exit out the door, and then you'll be back on the first floor. It's really just a result to mess with your brain, get a few items, and, uh, talk about your day, and have a lot of fun, really. But all the same, though, uh, I guess I could also talk about, you know, the uh, level of plot per distance travel, because, I mean, up until... Well, not too far off, actually. We've had very few cutscenes that really sort of interrupt the flow of gameplay. A lot of it is very much just sort of Harry exploring around the place. 
you know, just sort of keeping his thoughts to himself, and anything that, you know, you want Harry's input on, you examine the items with. So again, Silent Hill does handle its plot purchase since travel in a very... in a very sort of quiet and atmospheric kind of way. A lot of, a lot of horror games do tend to do this as well, but uh, some either have too little plot per distance travel in the sense that you're basically just a lone observer buggering about with gameplay and just sort of, you know, letting the euphoria of fear sort of take hold, or otherwise you're pretty much just, you know, doing the sort of modern video game thing of having the character every six seconds explaining to you what you're meant to be doing. It's like, oh no, I did a thing. I guess I better track down this character before time runs out. Oh no, that isn't good. They activated the time destruct sequence. There's a control panel. Better use the controls. You know, that sort of thing. But, I don't know, it, it hits the balance between atmosphere and, you know, giving you a little bit more story to unfurl. You know, just a little bit more detail. Not a plot dump or exposition dump. You know, just a little pepper. A little sprinkle of information. Like those telephones. Because dummy telephone not use. But yeah, there don't seem to be any powerpoints or uh, phone cords, so... Yeah, I guess it's absolutely useless. Let us leave without having any- Daddy? Help me! Daddy? Where are you? Cheryl! Oh god, my heart goes out to Harry, man. I would be... F Honestly, I'd be ripping this place apart if it was my little girl trapped in this sort of situation, but, uh, yes, it seems that this nightmare is not Cheryl's fault. Or at least not directly, but what do I mean by that? Well, maybe this is just a child's nightmare that just could have... Well, just sort of goes out of their control. I mean, that is sort of the distinction between nightmares and dreaming, really. Well, lucid dreaming specifically, but that's neither here nor there in this case. In the sense that with nightmares, you're pretty much... Well, you're pretty much sort of at a loss of control as your brain tries to compartmentalize information that you are otherwise unable to process. I don't know, the uh, machinations of sleep are also... I'm not really too sure how well documented they are in terms of human study, but... I don't know, it is a very fascinating uh, escape to explore in terms of, uh, you know, depth and, uh, you know, human psychology. But anyway, regardless of, this, uh, of everything else, I think it's about time we talk about some more trivia, and that's to do with voice acting, since we just heard Harry's voice actor, and yes, we finally know Michael G's fucking name. Harry Mason's voice actor, Michael Gwynn. Uh, who I believe also did an interview a couple of years ago with, uh, uh, you know, fans about his role as they actually managed to track him, uh, track him down, which is quite sweet. And it's not as if this was also a one-time deal either, because Michael Gwynn also had uh, voice credits in Castlevania Symphony of the Night as Dracula. I mean, bear in mind, this was pretty much a case of, you know, some of the voice actors were living in Japan, or a voice talent agency pretty much contacted them for a one-game deal. So, uh, yeah, the fact that he seemed to have a bit of a working relationship with Konami was quite interesting, actually. I mean, a similar thing could also be said of Dennis Fort, who also reappears uh, throughout the Silent Hill series as either minor characters, or uh, even as uh, Walter Sullivan in Silent Hill 4, or uh, even Eric Bossick, who was Henry Townsend in Silent Hill 4, also had voice credits in uh, even a game as far as up to Metal Gear Solid 5, with, uh, you know, voicing one of the soldiers in that game, so... Yeah. It's, it's kind of off for Konami to keep in contact with some voice actors, but... not others, really. Uh. I don't know, I mean, Konami and voice acting controversy... I think, I mean, I've already gone into it with the Silent Hill 2 and 3 uh, reviews when I talk about, you know, the whole Silent Hill 2 and 3 thing, and even in that case, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm hedging my bets as that's being part of the reason why, you know, we haven't had any of the Silent Hill games put in a sort of HD collection, you know, similar to, you know, what Metal Gear and Castlevania have had recently, but... I don't know. Very cynical thoughts about the future of Silent Hill, and that's all I'm gonna say for now as we... Huh. A jump scare. Done effectively in my survival horror game. Perish the thought. Oh well, we got the library reserve key, so uh, yeah, if we're feeling a little bit too frightened, Harry Mason, being a studious writer kind of guy, can uh, cuddle up with a good book. Yes, yeah, so maybe one from his childhood. Maybe one about a monster lurking. 
by that famous author I remember, Leonard Ryan. Unless he's a real person and I'm forgetting exactly what he did, but uh, whatever, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. In the meantime, however, I would also like to discuss uh, a certain aspect about the musical design. Again, I have already sort of talked about Akira Yamaoka's sound design being at its absolute best here, and uh, part of the reason for that isn't just because I feel that his horror tracks are much better in Silent Hill 1, but more specifically the way in which he uses, you know, a non diegetic sound for the sake of, you know, adding a lot of fear to the audience. Well, I mean, I suppose it could be non, -di uh, non diegetic I mean, it could be diegetic in the sense that Harry's also hearing these noises, but keeping his fear internalized. But that's beside the point. Uh, the thing that I'm trying to get at here is basically how when you enter certain rooms or, you know, or go out towards certain areas of the game, uh, music and silence gr build up gradually with dynamic elements added per room, purely for the sake of completely fucking with you. Again, like, I mean, it isn't there to punctuate like a major jump scare or, you know, to sort of, you know, showcase graphic imagery as would be the case with any other, you know, horror project which would think, okay, graphic imagery on its own is not scary, so I need to add scary sound effects or, you know, a scare chord just to build it up and make sure the audience fully understands that it's meant to be scary. No, I mean, we already get the visuals. But it's just the fact that they seem to add these discordant elements, like, uh, for example, as we enter the library reserve, we cross a certain threshold, it flags, you know, just some ambient knocks to start playing. I believe right around here, actually. And that is where it becomes incredibly frightening because, you know, there's nothing around here, but it's still fucking getting under your skin because you know something's out there. But you don't know what. No, oh, I guess we're not going to be reading the book about, uh... Yeah, if you choose to read that book over there, it pretty much discusses, uh, you know, paranoid delusions and, uh, poltergeist, saying that, you know, negative emotions, uh, can actually affect the spirit world. And that, uh, yeah, typically, because... Well, again, at least according to that writing, uh, you know, young women, particularly girls, tend to be a little bit more in... Well... Would they be in tune with their emotions, or would it simply be a case that they're more susceptible towards paranormal activity? Uh, whatever. Again, the point is, is that basically, uh, yeah, Cheryl, she's young, she is feminine, and, uh, well, there's some spooky shit going on, so, oh dear. And, uh, yes, this is what Leonard Ryan was referring to if you chose to read that little blood message. Who is afraid of a reptile? I'll swallow you up in a single bite. But, uh, this is an important hint for later. And, yes, also an effective way of dealing with lizards. Wait until they open their fleshy maw... Open fire and blast away. And that is how you destroy the lizard. A fairy tale that Harry read as a kid and no doubt read to his darling Cheryl when she was a, a what young wee lad, although uh, considering that Harry at this point is in his 30s, so, uh, you know, 1983, uh, minus 30, yeah, it would have been a fairy tale right back in the 50s. And, well, I mean, Silent Hill itself, I mean, given some of the paraphernalia in this school, looks like it would have been around, like, I don't know, 60s, 70s, if we're being generous. Yeah, well, I'm not really too knowledgeable about American infrastructure on, you know, uh, school education facilities, and I, you know, I kind of suspect that uh, Team Silent aren't either, which does bring me to another bit of trivia as we continue to solve a puzzle with that pink rubber ball that we picked up earlier. And uh, that is to say, in terms of trivia, that despite holding up fairly well for a Japanese take on Western, uh, Western horror, yeah, director Keichiro Toyama and uh, even Naoko Sato were so paranoid about getting the details right about, you know, certain facets of American culture, that, uh, yeah, the next game that they decided to create in terms of horror was set in more familiar territory with Forbidden Siren being set in Japan. And to be honest, that is something that I do want to genuinely give my props towards with uh, Silent Hill 1 specifically, in the sense that, again, there are a few bits and, spe bits and pieces here and there that do feel distinctly Japanese, but at the same time, it does a fairly decent job of, you know, understanding the subtle nuances of what separates, you know, uh, America from Japan, really. I mean, the streets are much wider open, you know, the, uh, you know, the streets and everything resemble, you know, pretty much your box-standard American town, really, which is, is something that I only really, really, really uh, excuse me, is something that I only really bring up compared to the, the likes of Resident Evil, where, you know, despite Raccoon City being fairly well open, and even as far into the fucking Resident Evil 3 remake, a lot of the streets in that game resemble, like, some of the more narrow passageways that you would see in Japan. You know, with a lot of, uh, I mean, you have your basic roads and whatever, but you also have, like, narrow alleyways, which, you know... A lot of American cities don't really have, or at least not with the very sort of junction-like design that, you know, Japanese cities tend to have. So, yeah. I mean, my hats go off to Team Silent, especially given that they had very few reference materials to really look up. Unless, of course, they sort of went the whole hog and looking up, you know, map details and, uh, you know, <laughs> geographical books in order to really get the details right, but... 
Yeah, anyway, I've kind of rambled on a little bit too much about trivia. In the meantime, though, what we need the pink rubber ball for, block the drain pipe, and then pretty much flush down a key. Thankfully, it doesn't go down into the, into the sewers, otherwise we'd be pretty well buggered. Oh, and there were some scummy children playing outside of my, my lawn. Oh, how I loathe them. Fucking kids, we should shoot them all. Huh. Well, it's funny to think that in the ten years I've been doing this, nothing has really changed. I still have an eternal hatred of children, and they're still playing outside of my lawn, except whereas before I was a teenager and could get away with murder, potentially, and just go to juvenile hall. Instead, now I would go to prison for a very, very long time. Ah, uh, The more things change, the more they stay the same, and the harsher the penalties. Oh well, hopefully I never get cornered by a police officer who goes, the Penalty game! Scully gets a life sentence in prison. No. Actually, that does kind of become a little bit funnier when we consider what item we get later in the game, and, uh, in turn a joke I also made during the Silent Hill Origins review. Uh, that I think only the media nerd really got because he was a big fan of it, or uh, possibly I had 96 as well. You know, I think he was also a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh, but... Uh, there's another here nor there in this case, and I'll bring up what that is later. <laughs> doubly funny, since it also contains a shadowy demonic spirit. Uh, but in any case, though, yeah, now that we've pretty much unlocked all that we need to, we can grab the key, unlock the classroom, hop on the log, and enter the house that Jack built. And yeah, it's a good thing that the key didn't fall into a fucking drain pipe, or... Eh, uh, whatever. Uh, I guess we'll just call it, uh, you know, other world logic and call it even. And uh, I suppose for the benefit of newcomers, something to also talk about in regards to what the other world actually is. Bear in mind, it is not a separate dimension. You know, like, I mean, again, it's not to do with, you know, other dimensional worlds, it's more to do with perception. Again, in this case, Harry is pretty much seeing the world demonic and twisted, because it's coming from the perspective of, well, as far as we're aware at this stage, Cheryl. Uh, again, so don't listen to the Silent Hill movie which tells you it's in another dimension, it's wrong, and uh, anybody who trusts it is stupid. Goddamn motherfucking stupid. And uh, to kind of get this out of the way as well, to remove all ambiguity from people who might be more familiar with later Silent Hill games, no, this isn't all like, oh, it was all in Harry's dream and he was going crazy or some fucking shit, which is only in one non-canonical ending, and isn't even the case to begin with because people who don't play Silent Hill and pay attention to its uh, rules and mythos are going to be sorely mistaken and spread lies and misinformation. I'm scared. Oh, the poor mumblers. Such large pieces of a gnocchi. Delicious gnocchi. If this was an Italiano restaurant, they would be a frightened. Uh, health drinks. Yeah, to kind of get into the health system as well, uh, there are actually three times of, uh, types of health items. Uh, you know, the medical kit that you saw before, which restores half your health. Uh, then you have also the health drinks, which restore a bit of your health, and then of course you have the ampoles, which is basically a... I guess what's meant to be like a, a syringe full of like morphine or whatever, or some sort of opiates to pretty much keep you from feeling pain. I suppose painkillers would be the best uh, way to put it, but yeah, they're pretty much there to pretty much give you a full health restore, so... Yeah, make sure to keep your health items stocked up, because otherwise, well, you're pretty much buggered. I wonder what the health drinks taste like, actually. I mean, I, I don't know, I always sort of imagine them tasting like a... Uh, and again, I don't, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but I always imagine like the health drinks in Silent Hill 1 tasting like Ribena. Uh, the health drinks in Silent Hill 2 and 3 tasting like... I don't know, uh, Strawberry Fanta or something? I don't know, I mean, uh, health drinks does imply that they're made of some sort of fruity substance, so... Who knows? Cherry flavored, maybe? Ah, whatever. Th the point is, they're health drinks and they're delicious and they... Help you be healthy. Yeah, this doesn't seem like we're quite done yet. Yeah, by the way, you can actually unlock that door right over there and, uh, transport yourself back. So we have a save of the game, because uh, if you remember beforehand, if you heard the roar down in the boiler room, yes, Freddy is indeed trademark coming for us, or perhaps a much more dangerous monster. So, we'll just have one little save of the game, and then I fear that we'll have... Some sort of frightening puzzle left for us to solve. But I'm sure we won't really have anything to worry about. It'll be fine. We're worrying too much. But yeah, like, I mean... 
I mean, again, I know this part is 28 minutes, but I mean, it just, I mean, in just a simple 25, we've pretty much managed to, you know, easily take care of a lot of areas of the game and, uh, you know, do a lot, do a lot of that without excessive backtracking. I mean, again, it's, it's less based on, you know, some of the more, you know, uh, you know, logical thinking puzzles that we would have had to work out before, and instead more on lateral thinking, and, uh, hmm, the valve puzzle. It was in the old boiler room, but now it is here. Well, I mean, I said that the, the, the other world is mainly focused on lateral thinking puzzles, but yeah, this one you also pretty much have to, well, resort back to your logical side of the brain, and it's uh, pretty much left three times, right once. So, uh, first left, then right, and then left twice. I mean, it's pretty much three lefts and a right, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm referring to the vowels, not uh, turn left. Uh, again, it's pretty much all left, because otherwise you might be left with an infinite number of combinations and will be stuck there for a fairly long time, actually, as uh, I was when I was first playing the game. Go back to the other one. There we go. Turn, turn, turn. God, I mean, uh, to be honest, I think Harry could have gotten the idea to maybe crawl underneath, you know, if he raised one of the bars high enough, but... Uh, I don't know. M maybe Silent Hill logic wouldn't let him pass, but whatever. We've solved the puzzle, and uh, now it seems we have left to go down to the basement, my dear. And apparently the other, the other world, despite being decrepit, is also capable of having working electricity and uh, an elevator. Sitting on an angry chair, shadowed walls that steal the air, stomachs churning and I don't care, what do I see across the way? It's a split head over yay, hey! Anyway, that's enough Alice in Chains references for one day, this is the split head. And it seems to have taken the form of the lizard Harry read in that book. Now, uh, avoiding that symbolic burning body in the central pit, that uh, appears to be a snack refaced for the beast, yeah, what you want to do here is basically just, uh, keep shooting towards the split head until it opens its maw. You know, pretty much Harry taunting the lizard until it goes, Who's afraid of a lizard going, I'll swallow you up in a single bite. And, uh, you'll tell that you'll be able to damage it when it starts leaking bile from its mouth. If you don't do it beforehand, it'll pretty much open up its, uh, maw and, uh, well, pretty much give you a bonk like that, but uh, if it does open its jaws, shoot into its maw really quickly. Uh, the amount of shots does uh, vary depending on the hard mode, but uh, yeah, if you get caught in its giant wide open attack, like that for instance, uh, yeah, you will die in one hit, so uh, yeah, be very careful. It takes sh uh, six shotgun blasts into its mouth in order to kill it on hard mode, and uh, I believe it's only uh, two or three on normal mode. I forget how many it is on easy mode, I think it might only be one, but don't quote me on that. But, in any case, uh, yeah, if we get another good shot into its mouth. Come on. There we go. 